Felice and I'm a Student Conservation Association intern with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're so glad you joined us for today's program, Wild Birds. Today we'll be going to three locations just outside the Houston area. The W.G. Jones State Forest, West Galveston Bay, and the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. Let's start with a special little woodpecker found in the forest just north of Houston. Even though its name includes red, it's actually a mostly black and white bird. Only the males have a little bit of red feathering on the side of their heads. Do you know what woodpecker I'm talking about? Meet the red cockaded woodpecker. What's really interesting about this woodpecker is that unlike other woodpeckers, it builds its home in live pine trees. Other woodpeckers use dead trees because the wood's rotten and soft, but not the red cockaded. It has to have pine trees that are alive. Now you're gonna meet Miss Donna. She's a biologist with the Texas A&M Forest Service. She's been studying the red cockaded woodpeckers for nearly 25 years. We're going to the W.G. Jones State Forest, one of the largest urban forests in the country, and home to the red cockaded woodpecker. She knows a lot about this bird, including what the inside of its home looks like. Well, this is what we call an artificial, means it's man-made, red cockaded woodpecker cavity. And let me show you what the inside looks like. Looks like this. This is the cavity that the birds will go in to roost in at night and to lay their eggs if they're going to lay eggs. It is, let's see the front. When they fly in, this is just like a little two inch wide hole that they can fly in, get inside the cavity. And then this is where they're going to sleep at night or if the female is laying eggs where she would lay her eggs. They don't put any nesting material in it. They don't gather feathers or leaves or anything like that. They just peck away a little bit on the sides and get some chips of wood from the side and that's their bedding. Now, let's hear more about why the red cockaded woodpeckers nest in living pine trees. I'll give you a hint. It has to do with snakes. Every morning when they get up, they peck through the bark layer and they get down to the sap layer of the tree and they want that sap to flow down. Because one thing, that sap is real sticky. And if a rat snake is climbing up the tree and gets that sap on his belly scales, it's going to irritate his belly scales or he's going to stick them together. So he's going to back off of that and not get in the tree and get the eggs and the young. So that pine sap in a live tree, it's only going to come out of a live tree, is a very good defense against the rat snake. That is so cool. So that's why the red cockaded woodpeckers prefer live trees to dead ones. It's all about the sap and how they use it to protect themselves from predators. Pretty smart, huh? Let's hear more about nest cavities from Miss Donna. <laughs> well, they do live in family groups and ideally there's a mom and a dad and maybe a helper bird or two that are brothers, maybe sisters, but usually brothers that hang around and help the family. But at night when it's time to go to bed, we call it going to roost. They go inside their cavity trees. Each one has their own cavity. Usually it's in a different tree. So dad's gonna go to one tree in his room and mom's gonna go to another tree in her room and each of the other family members, whether it's brothers or sisters, or whatever, they're going to go to their own separate bedrooms as well. Interesting. Is there any difference between where the birds roost? Well, the male, the dad, usually picks the nicest, newest, cleanest cavity because that is where the mom, the female, is going to lay her eggs. Yeah. His is nice and new and clean, so that's good environment for the eggs and for the young. Also, it's a real good sap producer when they peck those sap wells and let sap flow out to protect them from the snakes. It's going to be a real good tree for that. It sounds like the dad gets the best bedroom, but he has to do a lot of the work. How do you suppose Ms. Donna knows all of this? Well, she's a biologist and she studies them. Banding is one way that biologists study birds. Bands have numbers on them and they can be all different colors. The number and color combination lets biologists know what bird they're watching. It's like jewelry the bird never takes off. But how does she catch the bird so she can ban them? Miss Donna climbs up the pine tree to the nest cavity, and once she's there, she covers the hole with her hand. The baby birds are so young that their eyes aren't even open, but they can sense the shadow her hand makes. They think it's their mom or their dad or their brother or sister flying into the nest to feed them. They raise their little beaks to be fed, and that makes it easier to catch them. Miss Donna lowers this rubber tube with loops on the top of their nest. She carefully uses the loops to catch the baby little birds. Then she gently pulls them out of the nest. 
She has this soft little bag she can put them in until she gets back down to the ground and puts the band on their legs. She does this quickly so she can climb back up the tree and put the babies back safely in their nest. Do you know that the baby woodpecker's legs will grow longer but not fatter? This means that they can wear the bands forever. Thanks to the bands, there are birds Miss Donna has followed for five years. But how does Miss Donna even know there may be birds in the nest to begin with? We call this a peeper scope because we use it to peep into the nest cavity of the red cockaded woodpecker. Now on the top here, this is my little probe right here. It has got two lights and a camera. If I can turn this on. And there, there's the two lights. When I put it into the cavity, you'll see here in a minute, then I can see what's in the cavity, in the tree, in the nest, because down here, I've got a monitor that shows me just what I'm looking at. This is his tree where he comes to roost at night. And he will sit on the eggs, incubate the eggs at night. During the day, he'll come off the eggs and go off, look for food for the babies, and mom will come in and sit on the eggs. And then, after 26 days, they have all their feathers on and they're big enough and ready to fledge. That means they leave the nest and they have to find their own cavity tree to roost in at night. So I watch them each week. I can wait until they're old enough for me to band them when they're about seven or eight days old. Thanks to the peeper scoper, Ms. Donna can keep an eye on different nests until it's time for the baby birds to get their bands. Now she's got some tree climbing to do. If you're thinking to yourself, why does this matter? It matters because her research on the red cockaded woodpeckers helps us make better decisions on how to manage the forest for other birds and wildlife that live in the forest. Doesn't Ms. Donna have the coolest job ever? Now we're going to meet another person with a cool and important job. Meet Dr. Susan from the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. She's going to tell us all about American oyster catchers. Dr. Susan was once a computer security expert but she wanted a job protecting and studying birds. She picked a really special place to work. As the Director of Conservation Research at the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, she spends a lot of time in the West Galveston Bay. Dr. Susan researches all kinds of birds, including the amazing American oyster catcher. Check out this cool little bird. My primary focus is American oyster catcher, which is a big shorebird that breeds out here. Um, but there's a lot of other birds nesting out here too. We have a lot of black skimmers on this island and foresters terns. They all nest on the ground, so you can't really tell they're on a nest. Um, but they are, so it's important to not get too close to the islands because we don't want to spook the birds off their nests because the eggs can get too hot in the sun um, or a predator could get them. And uh, so we just want to be careful around the islands and keep the birds safe and uh, let them do their nesting thing and then we'll have lots of bird babies. First of all, American oyster catchers actually like oysters. See that big orange bill? It can get up to four inches long and it's used for opening shells. While oysters are their favorite food, they also eat other shellfish as well as hermit crabs and marine worms. They even eat the little coquina clam shells you see poking out of the sand when you walk on the beach. It hunts by roving along an oyster reef looking for shells that are partially open. When feeding on oysters, they like to use their flat bills kind of like a knife. When it finds the right oyster, the American oyster catcher jabs its bill inside the shell to slice that muscle that's holding the shell together. The shell then falls apart and the bird can easily gobble up that tasty oyster inside. Another way they use their bills is like a hammer. If they find a loose oyster, they pick it up and move it to a hard ground and then hammer away at it until their bill smashes it open. Male and female American oyster catchers look a lot alike. Can you tell the difference? Scientists usually can tell the difference by the bird's weight. The females weigh more than the males. Another way to tell the difference is their eyes. Check out those peepers. Aren't they amazing? See this black little smudge around the eye? Usually the females will have more of it than the males. And check out those feet and toes. Their toes are meant for walking on oyster shells. So where can you see these cool little birds? Well, along oyster reefs in Galveston Bay, for one. But you're more likely to see them on the small, low lying islands in the bay. If you get lucky, sometimes you can see them on the beach, too. 
seabirds like islands because they offer protection from all the dangers found on the mainland, like cars driving on the beach, outdoor cats, or even raccoons. In the springtime, a male American oyster catcher will make several shallow little scrapes within his island territory. These scrapes are just like little bowls on sandy or rocky ground, and he'll line them with special little shells or pebbles to camouflage the speckled eggs in the nest. A female will pick the scrape she likes best and lay her eggs, usually about three of them. Both the male and the female will sit on the eggs to incubate them. They also work together to feed the chicks for about two months until the babies can feed on their own. Chicks can stay with their parents for up to six months while they learn how to do American oyster catcher things. Thanks to research of scientists like Dr. Susan, we know all of this. Dr. Susan has studied these birds for nine years in the West Galveston Bay. Her favorite American oyster catcher is named H0, and this guy is one of the first she banded. Amazingly, he still nests in the same place where she first saw him years ago. Dr. Susan has studied these birds long enough to know their territories, like where they nest, what they like to eat, but instead of climbing trees like Miss Donna, Dr. Susan uses a boat and binoculars to find her birds. During the nesting season, she goes out on her boat about once a week to check the different islands and see what the birds are up to. This is the best time to study them because as you heard before, American oyster catchers like to return to the same territories every year to nest. Dr. Susan's not only checking the nests and eggs, but she's also looking for an opportunity to ban new birds. Give those birds some jewelry, Dr. Susan. When she spots a bird without a band, it's time to bring out the decoys. Do you know what a decoy is? A decoy is an imitation of an animal that's used to attract other animals. American oyster catchers are very territorial, and they think the decoys are real birds moving in on their home turf. They don't like this at all and swoop in and scare off the new intruders. But of course, the decoys are a trick that helps Dr. Susan safely catch them. Once caught, she covers the bird's head to keep it calm and safe. She puts a band on his leg as well and measures the beak and the wing length before weighing it. After she bands it and collects all the necessary information about the bird, Dr. Susan releases it so the bird can get back to doing American oyster catcher things. Dr. Susan has banded more than 350 American oyster catchers in her career. All the information she gathers helps protect American oyster catchers and other seabirds. Speaking of protecting American oyster catchers, want to know what you can do to help? For starters, don't litter. Always, always dispose of your fishing line and balloons properly. Dr. Susan has seen birds tangled in fishing line and balloon strings and other litter in their habitat. Strings are very dangerous for all wildlife, not just American oyster catchers. It's really important, so don't litter. Another thing, keep your distance from the islands out in the Galveston Bay, especially if you're on a boat or jet ski. If you get too close, you might scare the birds away and then their eggs won't properly incubate. Or worse, a predator might get into the nest. Like the American Bird Conservancy says, fish swim and play from 50 yards away. Now let's meet a bird that really likes to dance, stomp its feet, and make a lot of noise on the prairie, all in an effort to get a girlfriend. Get ready because this little chicken likes to boogie. Meet the Atwater's Prairie Chicken. Isn't he a cutie? But he's not really a chicken after all. He's technically a grouse, a medium to large game bird with a plump body and feathered legs. Males are larger and more striking than the females, and they go through a lot of trouble to find a girlfriend. In the spring, male Atwater's prairie chicken gather on their booming grounds. Do you know what a booming ground is? These are places where some grouse species go to put on a show to attract the ladies. It's kind of like a stage where the male birds perform for the females, except this show's free. The Outwater's Prairie Chicken will gather here in the springtime, and the males will stomp their feet, spin around, and inflate these special air sacs while making a loud booming sound. They jump and charge one another to put on a big display, but it's all just for show. Nobody gets hurt, but it does get pretty rowdy. All this dancing and booming's done to attract the females called hens. It's quite an impressive show. If a hen decides she likes to dance moves put on a particular male bird, she picks him and then they pair up. How about you? 
Do you like to dance? If so, the Atwaters dance might be the right one for you. Check out this fun video. Hi, my name is Lori Lomas Gonzalez. I'm the wildlife biologist at Trinity River National Wildlife Refuge, but I used to work at Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge, where I got a chance to see a lot of Atwater's prairie chickens booming. And so today I'm gonna to show you my impression of an Atwater Prairie Chicken booming. First of all, you have to find an area with nice short grass. They like that. Next, you listen for the sound of their boom, which sounds like this. And they also make other noises, but it kind of sounds like that. So what does an Atwater's Prairie Chicken do? First, they lean over as far as they can and they fan out their tail feathers. And then from there, they take that wing, they drop it down, open it real wide, and then they start stomping. And they'll start stomping and they'll move forward and they'll move back and they'll spin around and then they'll stand up and go, Whoo! They have these large yellow sacks and they blow it up real big and they do that while they make that noise. Then they'll drop back down and they'll start stomping around, spinning around, trying to impress the ladies. Wasn't that fun? Now you know about the bird, we'll hope you'll travel out to the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge in the spring to see them strutting their stuff on the prairie. Unfortunately, today there aren't many of them left in the wild because of loss of prairie habitat, their home. In fact, there are really two places left in the world where they exist, on private lands and the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge, which is about an hour west of Houston. Atwater's prairie chickens are highly endangered which means there aren't many of them left. The good news is that there are a lot of partners working together to help make sure this little dancing bird is here to stay. Want to know how you can help? For starters, tell everyone you know about the Atwater's Prairie Chicken. Make your own Atwater's dance video and share it with the rest of us using the hashtag dancing like an Atwater's. Do a presentation at your school about this colorful dancing booming bird that really is a Houston bird. You can also help by restoring the prairie by planting native plants in your yard. Don't you just love that dancing little bird? Now we're going to share a map that shows you where you can find all these cool little birds near Houston. To see the Atwater's Prairie Chicken, be sure to visit the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge in the spring to watch some booming. If you want to check out the red cockaded woodpeckers, visit the Jones State Forest, located about 30 minutes outside of Houston near Conroe. You can see them any time of the year. Check out the American Oyster Catchers next time you go to Galveston Bay. You'll know them by that big orange bill. If you would like to see and enjoy wildlife, visit a National Wildlife Refuge near you. Did you know there are five National Wildlife Refuges within a one hour drive of Houston? And there are more than 560 National Wildlife Refuges in the United States and its territories. These are public lands set aside and managed for the benefit of wildlife and you. Thanks for joining us today and watching the Wild Birds program. We hope you enjoyed learning about these special birds found right here in the Houston area. Before we close, I wanna give a special thanks to the Valenti School of Communication at the University of Houston. They were a real help in making this video possible. Now be sure to watch the credits where we'll give you a few more details on how you can find these wild birds on your next nature adventure. See you later, alligators!